Hello, good morning, everyone. Let's uh, get started. Um, so we will wrap up lecture three today. And after that, we will start on lecture four. Four is pretty short. Uh, we probably will be able to do most of it today. And um, on Wednesday's class, we'll finish number four and we will uh, take up the lab. Uh, when more people come, I'll explain what to expect for the lab. Uh, and of course, your first test will be next uh, Wednesday. So let's uh, let's get to it then. Why don't we start with uh, reviewing a little bit of um, what we did last class, and you know, just just wait for people to kind of trickle in. Um, there is a question here in your study guide that asks for four types of T cell effector and state their main function. So remember um, from the bone marrow the T cells are going to uh, come out and they will uh, migrate to your thymus where they will continue to mature. And these T cells um, are what we call naive T cells, right? And the naive T cells will require, you know what, I'm just going to actually put it right here. The naive T cells uh, requires the activation by an APC, an antigen presenting cell, such as a macrophage. Okay? And once they're selected, they will undergo clonal expansion, which just means they copy themselves, they undergo mitosis, um, and they could become one of the four effectors. Uh, and the effectors we learned were um, helper T cell, helper T cell. We have cytotoxic or a killer T cell. Uh, oops, or a killer T cell. And um, we have memory T cell as well as suppressor T cell. Okay, now you can fill in a function yourself by looking at the notes. I'm just going to verbally um, review them for you. The helper T cells is responsible for activating the naive B cell. Okay, so similarly, in this situation, we have naive B cell. Now the B cells stay in the bone marrow. They don't move to the thymus. That's why they're called B cells, B for bone marrow, T for thymus. And this will require the helper T cell. Okay, so that's what they do. They activate the naive B cells. The cytotoxic T cells and the killer T cells will go kill infected cells. Now, I don't think I um, specifically mentioned this last class. It might be, maybe it's in the notes. I don't remember, but I, let me just write this down for you. Okay, so, so we said kill infected cell. I think that's all we had in the note last time, uh, but I didn't tell you how they killed them. Okay, so what they actually do is um, they use a protein called perforin. Called perforin to create holes in the target. In, in the cell in the cell membrane of the target. Okay. And then after uh, forming the holes, um, I'll continue here. They will pump toxins through the holes to trigger to trigger apoptosis program cell death. Okay, so they put some holes in the target's membrane, the membrane of the infected cells. They pump some toxins through those holes, and then those toxins is going to cause the cell to um, basically kill themselves. Yeah, so that's the uh, cytotoxic T cell. Um, do I have a slide on that? I don't remember. Honestly, has been uh, no. I think I think that's not is on the slide. But uh, in the fill in the blanks, one of them asked for the, the, the term porphyrin. That's what it is. Like to perforate is to make holes, right, uh, into something. So that's the protein that does that. Okay. 
Uh, memory cells, they stay in the body for a very long time is the reason why we have protection against all the um, infections that we overcame, right? Um, and usually the second time you get infected by the same thing, the immune response is much faster and much stronger. Uh, and that is due to the presence of memory T cells. Okay, and so pressing T cells just stops the whole thing when the infection is clear. All right, two types of effectors for naive B cells. Um, anybody want to help me out here? What are they called, huh? What are the effectors of naive B cells? No, nothing yet, too early. Okay, that's fine. Um, one of them is, uh, yeah, Brill said uh, plasma cell. Yep, that's right, plasma cell. And these are the ones that make um, antibodies, right? Similarly, we also will have the memory B cell. Okay, and that has the same function as the memory T cells. Uh, they stick around in your body for a very long time. Now these um, immune response that involve the T cells, I don't know if you remember, but uh, they are called the cell mediated. Cell mediated immunity. And then over here, these are called uh, antibody mediated. immunity, okay, sometimes also called humoral immunity, all right, um, so there you have it, that's the, um, that's a quick summary of what we did, all right, we're going to go ahead and skip to the application questions. Let's take a look at the first one here. <clears throat> Joffrey is bitten by a rattlesnake while on a camping trip. His friends immediately rush him to an emergency facility. The venom is a protein-based toxin. What treatment would provide immediate protection and why? Anybody want to share their thoughts on this? What should we give them? This has to do with the whole active passive immunity that we talked about. What kind of treatment should we give? Poor Joffrey. Uh, serum. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's very good. Uh, and and Zia, uh, um, Zia said in the um, in the chat that serum is a uh, is an example of, of artificial passive. That's correct, right? So serum is the answer, and it is artificial because you are going to have to receive an injection. And it's passive because the antibodies in the serum uh, was not created by you. Someone else made that. Okay. Explain the type of immunity that is. Uh, we just explained that. Um, and and of course the antibody was created using the the toxin as a as a trigger, right? Maybe they made it in an animal or something like that. If Joffrey were to be bitten by another rattlesnake in the future, unlucky Joffrey, will he be immune to the toxin? What do you guys think? Is he going to have protection from his first venom exposure? No. No, and why not? Because um, the serum works um, immediately, but it's only temporarily. Exactly. Those were my exact wording in the lecture. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so no, because serum uh, is only temporary. Okay, the antibodies, once they break down, they will no longer be effective um, and you will have to have another serum. Um, that's what my doctor told me. I asked him, so if I, if I get bitten by another dog, do I have to come in again and get all these shots? I kind of knew the answer, but I, I felt like asking that. Um, and, and then he's like, yeah, yeah, you, you would have to uh, because these are just serum. It's like, oh, okay, I'll watch out from now on. So, you know, every time I go out for a jog now, I see a dog coming. I, immediately uh, switch to uh, uh, the opposite um, opposite sidewalk. Watch me get run over by a car next time. Anyway, uh, this is number two. 
Uh, one dose of vaccine against chickenpox will virtually offer a lifetime protection against the virus, whereas a new flu shot is needed every year. Explain the reason for this. Well, I kind of, you know, um, explain this concept here and there throughout the lecture, but let, let's, you know, talk about it again. The key situation, the key reason here uh, is that the chickenpox, um, the virus, the virus that causes chickenpox, okay, uh, don't mutate. It's the same virus for as long as we know it. Okay, so if you if you get uh, a vaccine, your body creates the antibodies for it. Um, when the real thing comes, you're going to be protected. Okay? You're not going to get a new string of chickenpox um, that you don't have immunity against, um, and that's why it's lifetime protection. Now, for the flu virus, is um, actually a little bit different. Does anybody know what causes the flu? What is the name of the like? I mean, we keep on calling it the flu virus, right? But it actually has a has a like a official name, right? What 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 causes the flu? Flu is just a short form of the whole name. Yeah, a bro said influenza, right? That's right, influenza virus. Okay, now how many different types of influenzas are there? Anybody know? Just trying to have conversation here, guys. Two. <laughs> two? Okay. And then what, what are the two types that you know? Ashana? A and B. Okay, very good. All right. So uh, A, B, actually there are four types, C and D. But I understand mm -hmm. why you said two types because these are the two types that are of concern. Okay. These are the ones, A and B, that causes seasonal, seasonal um, uh, infection. Okay. Um, C and uh, D doesn't even concern human. D is mostly like infecting like cattle and, and stuff like that. Doesn't really cause a uh, illness in people. And C is like super mild, uh, even if it does infect human. Uh, but B and D are the ones that are responsible for seasonal infection. Okay, they can cause things like epidemic. All right, now we are in the midst of a pandemic. But then you know, if it's really really localized, then we call it an endemic, right? And then if it spreads a little bit outside of the um, of a contained region, then we call it like an epidemic. Right? And then if it goes like throughout the entire world, then it's a pandemic, right? So A and B, they are known to cause seasonal uh, epidemic. And then the influenza A, influenza A, that's the one that is known to cause pandemic. Okay. Um, does anybody know any name of any influenza A that uh, has made the headlines in the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years? Anyone know any? Uh, uh, SARS, is, uh, SARS is like COVID, actually. They are like both coronaviruses. Uh, that's not flu, but, but good try. Anyone else? It has some letters in it and some numbers. I'm, I'm sure you have heard of it. If I say it, you were like, oh, yeah, I remember hearing about that. H1N1? H1N1, that's correct. Um, and when was this last pandemic? Does anybody remember? It? Anyone remember we actually had a pandemic recently before this, like, super big one? The last one was caused by H1N1. And all of you were born by that at that time. Guarantee. Nobody remembers? Yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, it was, right. it was like, what was it? They called it like a swine flu or the bird flu or something like that, and they changed it a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. It was a uh, two thousand and nine. Okay, it was the H one N one swine flu. They called swine flu at the time, right? Which which implies it came from the the pig, but it was like a like a recombinant virus, meaning it actually picks up um, genetic material from different horses and created this, you know kind of novel strain right uh and and at the time people thought it was going to be out of control but then you know they they, they rolled the vaccine pretty quickly and the thing just kind of snapped out um on its own okay? and and it, and it didn't last a, a, a very long uh so that was like you know uh 12 years 14 years ago right um but but h1n1 is one of them does anybody know another one this is the swine flu, right? And then there's a bird flu. Anybody heard of the bird one? H something and something. There's a there's a there is a moral to this story. I'm not just like you know talking about random stuff here. 
Bird flu, anyone? H2N2? Uh, that's a guess. Yeah, okay, good try. Uh, anyone from Hong Kong here? That's where I came from. Or China. Uh, that was a really big one when it came out, the bird flu with the chickens. They had to kill a lot of chickens to um, to prevent the spread of it. No, no, no? Okay. I know uh, in Chinese, but not in English. I don't know. Oh, you probably like know the actual flu, uh, virus on. name, right? Yeah. But then, yeah, uh, yeah that's the H5N1. Uh, that's the bird flu, right? Um, anyway, my point is, you know, the, the influenza A, uh, the... Um, the virus is their name after the H and the N. And you're like, you know, what, what's the H and what's the N? Well, if you think about the virus, right, on the surface of the viruses, um, there are antigens, right? Just like our blood cells have antigen A, antigen B, right? So in the flu virus, the influenza virus A, they have antigen H and antigen N on them, okay? H stands for something called like hemagglutinin and N is neuroamidase, but we're just going to call it N and H, okay? They're just like some proteins. And it turns out there are a total of 18 different versions of H, and then there are 11 different versions of N. So depending on which um, subtype of H and N you have, the virus is named after that, right? So like H5N1, that's like subtype number five for the H antigen and subtype one for the N antigen. And some combinations of H and N makes the virus more infectious than others, um, and therefore more at risk of creating like a pandemic, right? So every year when we when we get the flu shot, and I think I briefly mentioned this before, um, the, the, the people who keep track of these things, right, people at the Center for Disease and Control, CDC, uh, people at World Health Organization, right? Um, they would try to predict the most uh, three dominant strain of the upcoming season. And they would create a, a vaccine uh, for those three uh, strains of, of flu, okay? But these are just predictions. So sometimes they are like way off. Sometimes they, they created the vaccine and it turns out it was completely three, um, uh, a different three string. And, and, and for that year, the flu, the flu shot would be uh, quite ineffective. Now, living in the Northern Hemisphere, we sort of have an advantage um, in that we can look at what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere in countries like Australia, because they are, they are gonna be having their winter before us, right? So we can see, um, if the if the um, if the vaccines are effective uh, um, for their winter, and and then plan accordingly, right, for our winter. If you see that there is a high infection despite of high vaccination in Australia's winter, um, then you know we're going to be braced for uh, a, a tough winter, so to speak, and then you're going to have to. Um, uh, 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 plan for maybe like increased hospitalization and stuff like that. Although nowadays, right, like with, with COVID and RSV and all that stuff, basically all the hospitals are at maximum capacity. Uh, but, but that's why, that's why we need to have a, have a new flu shot every year because um, next year, the three dominant strain is going to be different. Right. Um, and, and you will need to have it. Now, some people ask, why not just like, you know, get flu shot for all of them. Right. Uh, well, if there are 18 um, choices for um, subtype for H and 11 subtype for N, you can do some math, right? You can do 18 times 11, and it gives you 198 possible combination. Right? It's impossible to get vaccinated for all of them, right? Uh, financially, it's expensive to make, and you know, like your body might not be able to handle um, all that different subtypes uh, um, at once, right? So um, that is the reason uh, for that. Okay, next one. Uh, HIV infects macrophage and destroy them. Explain how this will affect your immune system. Well, we learned that the macrophage is, um, is an example of an APC, right? APC. And APC is very important because they are the link between the innate immunity and the adaptive immunity, right? Um, the, the, the macrophage will will eat up whatever is infecting your body, it will undergo antigen processing, and then it will present it to the naive T cell and then activating the whole adaptive immunity. If the HIV virus infects the macrophage and kills them off, you essentially destroy your entire um, acquired immunity uh, branch, right? So you, you're not gonna be able to create memory cells, you're not gonna be able to create antibodies um, and, and that's why we call people who have um, uh, um, HIV, right? They have the 
acquired immunodeficiency, right? AIDS, that's what it stands for. Um, essentially, they have, no they have no immunity. They cannot fight off um, any infections. Okay, so more on that in a bit. Uh, finally, last one. So many of the COVID vaccines, as you know, they are called mRNA, mRNA vaccines. Um, so how do they work? Well, you probably have maybe read something about it by this point, but uh, it's actually related to what we are talking about, right? So uh, they use a little bit of lipid, like a lipid coating, and then and then there is a little bit of um, messenger RNA in the um, in the lipid, and the messenger RNA it codes for codes for the spike proteins on the virus. Okay, so on the surface of the coronavirus, there are many antigens again. So one of those proteins, the spike proteins, is encoded by this messenger RNA. So they inject it into your, your muscle um, in the arm. And, and what happens is um, you will have an, uh, a kind of APC called a dendritic cell. We didn't learn about it previously, but it's another APC. And, and this thing will go into the dendritic cell. And because it's a, it's a messenger RNA, um, the mRNA will get translated right, by ribosomes. Uh, and then it will put some of those spike, spike proteins on the surface of your dendritic cells. Okay, And then this dendritic cells will present these spikes to a naive T cell in your system. Okay, And uh, then naive T cell gets activated and everything that we talked about last class will, will occur. And ultimately, you will end up having antibodies produced by the plasma cells that will recognize these spike proteins. So when the actual virus comes and infects you, this is the actual COVID virus, uh, and they have the spike proteins as well, along with other things that would cause you to become ill, uh, but that's okay. You already have the antibody. So the antibody will tag them. It will neutralize them. It will help your you know, uh, immune system to get rid of them before they go out of control and make you really, really sick. All right. So that is the, uh, the underlying principle of how the mRNA vaccine works. Any question about any of these four application questions uh, before I move back to the um, PowerPoints? Already. So uh, let's just ask you a poll question uh, to see what you think. And if you have uh, read the um, PowerPoint slides ahead of time, you probably might know the answer. Um, if not, that's okay. I just want to know. Uh, in, in the history of mankind, how many diseases have we completely eradicated, completely get rid of, gotten rid of, okay? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it three? Is it 10? Or is it more than 10? Okay, so what do you think? Let's do the poll and let me know. How many diseases, virus, pathogens have we completely eradicated? If you cannot see the poll, you can put your answer in the chat box as well. That's another way to participate. Okay. Uh, anyone else before I close the poll? Okay, well, we have some very optimistic people, uh, more than 10, and we have some very pessimistic people saying zero. Uh, but the correct answer, the correct answer is one. Okay, so of all the infectious diseases. Professor, I yeah. thought, oh, oh I, I didn't see that part. I thought A was one. 
<laughs> oh, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't even know what you choose uh, because the whole thing is uh, anonymous. But thank you for letting me know. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, we have only been able to eradicate one infectious disease. Okay, uh, and that is smallpox. All right, so let's uh, talk a little bit about smallpox. You might have heard about it um, because recently there was also the monkeypox, right? So uh, it's another pox virus. There are a lot of pox viruses like smallpox, monkeypox, uh, um, uh, chickenpox, cowpox, or all these pox viruses. But some are very um, lethal compared to other strains. So smallpox is very, very lethal. Okay, It's caused by the variola virus, the same uh, a family of viruses that causes all the other pox um, virus that we talked about, you know, chickenpox, monkeypox, all that stuff. Uh, and people who had smallpox would have fever, right? distinctive, distinctive uh, uh, skin rash that get progressively worse. Uh, they will be in quite a bit of pain. Um, most people do recover, but about three out of 10 uh, people with the disease will, will die. That is a pretty high um, mortality rate, right? 30% of the people who contract it will die. And for those who survive, uh, they have these terrible, terrible scar uh, uh, that covers their body. And sometimes uh, it would even uh, leave them with, uh, with a blind eye uh, or, or both eyes uh, are blind. And, uh, and it's just you know, not something that you want to, want to live with. Um, and so there was this guy, um, his name was uh, Edward Jenner. He uh, was um, named as like the, uh, the, the father of vaccine, of, of uh, vaccination. Okay, he's, he's basically credited as the person who created the idea of vaccination. Okay, so that began in the 1796, okay. And uh, he observed that uh, milkmaids, which are people who milk the cows, okay, so he, he's a pretty well-off guy, I, I presume, right? Uh, he has people working um, in his house, right, to milk the cows for him and, and, you know, tend to his garden and stuff like that. So he noticed the milkmaid who got uh, cowpox from, the, from milking the cows, um, they don't show any symptoms of smallpox when, when they're exposed to it, okay? So the cows, uh, there was a cow, this is a true story, from what I read anyways, the, there's a cow named uh, Blossom and Blossom has these cowpox in the, um, in the, uh, in the udder. The udder is where you like squeeze and get the milk. Okay. So, so the milkmaid who, 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 who milked uh, Blossom um, end up catching these uh, cowpox and, and, you know, they have these sores on the hand. Cowpox are not um, deadly. Okay. They don't cause you to become ill or anything like that. Uh, but once they recover from these, uh, cowpox, uh, it appears that they, they don't get sick from the smallpox. Uh, and so Jenna, he theorized that um, the immunity you gain from the cowpox would actually protect you from the smallpox. Okay. So uh, the milkmaid was uh, Sarah, I think that was her name. Um, and so to test his hypothesis, to test his theory, Jenna took uh, the gardener's nine-year-old son, James. He didn't take his own son, he took the gardener's son, uh, which is like super unethical. Um, nowadays, you know, you go to jail for doing something like that. But anyway, back then, you know, it's, it's a different world. Okay, so he, he, he took the uh, boy and uh, he, you know, infected the boy with, uh, with cowpox. And afterwards, uh, uh, he did the really crazy thing. After the boy recovered from the cowpox, he took a little bit of material from the uh, from the smallpox smallpox uh, um, scab from another infected person, and then he exposed the boy to it. Um, and fortunately, he was correct, and that the boy actually did not uh, get the smallpox. Um, he the boy didn't get infected. He didn't he didn't die from it or anything like that. And and that kind of proves the first principle of. Um, of, of how vaccination works. Uh, and shortly after that, um, it was mass produced um, and uh, everybody got inoculated uh, and the uh, smallpox was eradicated. Uh, and the last reported case was uh, 1977. Now the, uh, the cow, Blossom, um, was very famous because of, you know, the link to the cowpox and how discovery of the vaccine actually occur, that when the cow die, um, they preserve the hind uh, of the cow. And uh, it was given as a gift to, uh, to Canada. Uh, I forgot when, but um, if you go to downtown, um, like U of T, University of Toronto, uh, I think the medical science building, um, they, hang the, they hang the hind of blossom there. 
uh, along with the stories of, of the vaccination. Um, so, you know, next time you're downtown and you're looking for something to, to see, uh, you can definitely um, check it out. Now, based on what you learned about vaccination or about um, antibodies, right? Uh, this was very fortunate because the antibodies you make for one virus typically will not work for another virus, right? Um, but it just happens in this particular case, the cowpox and the smallpox are, are, are similar enough that they share some antigens on the surface. And so the antibodies that you make for one actually works for the other one as well. So this is purely by chance, right? Um, very fortunate for, for humanity and for the boy that it, it turns out to work. Okay. Um, there is actually another um, type of vaccination that we get that relies on this principle, where like the cow version of the disease is, is not very um, uh, not very strong, doesn't really cause you to become very ill, but it gives you protection for the more deadly human versions. Any of you have like a like a big scar on the um, on like your upper left arm or right arm? Um, if you have that, yeah, Brill in the um, in the uh, message already said, right, um, that scar is for the, the BCG vaccine, okay? And BCG vaccine is um, immunization against tuberculosis, TB, all right? Um, so where I came from, Hong Kong, uh, we had mandatory vaccination um, to, um, I think it was grade three maybe, that they gave me the, the BCG vaccine um, and it creates like a, like a really big scar. Apparently the scar, um, tells you that the vaccine is uh, is is working, um, and I don't I don't know what <laughs> what went wrong uh, with my shot. Like everybody, like when I see their people who had the shot, their scar is like you know like a like a little circle, um, and uh, you know at the size of um, uh, pretty small. Okay, like uh, you know if if you hole punch your paper, it's it's about that that the size of that hole. But my scar got like really really big, right? Like I, it's like super disgusting and ugly. I'm not gonna show you, uh, but it's really big. Um, and and it was funny because when I go get um the the COVID shot, the 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 doctor who gave me the shot saw the scar and 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 she, she was shocked. She was like, "What happened here?" I was like, "Yep, yeah, uh, BCG." And then she said, "Usually it's not supposed to be like that." And I was like, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, anyway nobody knows why. But, um, but the BCG vaccine inoculate you with the cow version of the TB, right? And then that gives you protection for the actual TB uh, of the human form. Yeah, okay. Yeah, some people are sharing that they have, uh, they have the big one too. So yeah, maybe we can uh, one day all compare our scars and uh, make each other feel better. <laughs> okay, uh, let's just wrap up the lesson with uh, some other stuff. Uh, allergies, okay. Uh, if you have seasonal allergies, you know they are very annoying. Um, uh, it's uh, it's in in fact um, an overreaction of your immune system against something that is um, that is innocuous, something that doesn't actually cause any harm. Um, and 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 with all these uh, immune response, these hypersensitivity against um, these harmless things. Um, at, at a minimum, it, it, it kind of ruined your day with, you know, the, the itchy eyes and the runny nose and so on and so forth. Um, but in the extreme, it could cause what's called anaphylactic shock. Okay, so this is a severe form of the allergic reaction. And you probably, if you have kids, you probably know, um, you know, school, they are, they are a nut-free environment. Um, and, and the reason for that is because a lot of kids, um, they have this anaphylactic shock um, uh, condition. Uh, if they're exposed to, to nuts, it could cause their entire body to go into uh, uh, um, an allergic reaction um, and, and you have um, systemic release of the histamine and the histamine causes, uh, of course, the vasodilation uh, and then leaking fluids all over the place, which results in a rapid drop in blood pressure. Uh, and that could be life uh, threatening. The throat also uh, swells uh, uh, substantially, making it very difficult to breathe. Uh, and so there is a narrow window um, for someone who experiencing um, anaphylactic shock in, um, that you could kind of reverse the process, right? And, and to reverse it, you would give them the uh, EpiPen, okay? Uh, the Epi in the EpiPen stands for epinephrine. 
Um, and epinephrine is just another word for uh, adrenaline. Okay, um, you heard of people say adrenaline rush, right? It's actually the same, same thing. Epinephrine, adrenaline is the same, two different words for the same um, hormone in your body. Uh, and, and this uh, surge of epinephrine from the EpiPen will counteract the effect of the, um, of the histamine, right? It will cause your blood vessel to constrict, it will increase your heart rate uh, and, and you know, dilate your, your, your bronchi and reverses all that process. Uh, it's not difficult to imagine, right? Because if you think about, you know, in a situation where you're in danger, right? Or like if you're on a roller coaster ride or something, right? All that feeling that you get is associated with uh, with adrenaline, right? The, the heart pumping, right? Uh, uh, you, you feel like you, you have this surge of energy, uh, and and that is actually caused by you know the the blood vessel constricting and then the airway opening, um, and and that is the perfect uh, antidote for uh, for for having too much histamine in your system. Nut is not the only thing that could trigger anaphylactic shock. Right? Bee sting is another common one. Penicillin. Right, uh, the antibiotics, right? Those are um, some of the common triggers, but really, uh, it, it could be anything, uh, and it's very specific for the people. Some people are allergic, like severely allergic to, to uh, shellfish, right? To like salmon, that kind of stuff. Um, it's really depending on the genetic makeup of the person, but these are the common ones. Uh, how does allergen like nuts? enter into the bloodstream. It doesn't have to enter the bloodstream, right? Um, you can ingest it, you can inhale it. Uh, 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 remember, you have uh, lymphatic organs um, in the tonsils, right? So just, just by breathing it in, right, uh, that could already trigger it. It doesn't necessarily have to end up in your bloodstream per se, right? Oh, okay, because on the note, I, I saw that the anaphylactic shock uh, occurred because the allergen has entered the bloodstream. That's why I asked this question. Uh, on this slide? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's why the, I had this question. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. But uh, it doesn't necessarily have to physically enter the bloodstream. Yeah. But for things like penicillin, right? Yeah, that, that if you get like, you know, take the drug and then you absorb it, that would be in the bloodstream. Yeah. Uh, here are some like uh, uh, news title that I saw related to what we're talking about. Um, a girl with severe nut allergy died after kissing boyfriend who had eaten peanut butter sandwich, right? Um, so, you know, it doesn't have, even have to be you who are personally consuming it, right? It could be indirect, like in this case, which makes it really dangerous, right? Um, I remember also reading something about uh, some teenagers like uh, doing it as a prank, they like spread peanut butter at the park or something. And that is just like horrible, right? If, if a kid slide down the slide and, and they had anaphylactic shock, um, you know, it could potentially be lethal. Um, it's just like a horrible, horrible thing to, to read about. Uh, here's another guy, right? Um, he, uh, he had some salmon uh, at the um, at the restaurant, um, and and what happened was he was he was eating with a friend. He ordered he ordered the the beef, but then there was a mixed up, and then the salmon came, and then because the of the low lighting of the of the restaurant, according to the article, he wasn't able to tell whether it was beef or salmon, so he ate it anyways, and turned out to be salmon. And then immediately he he started having symptoms of the um, anaphylactic shock, right? But he forgot his epipen in the in the um, in the car. Uh, his friend, who was a doctor, immediately know what's going on and then, you know, ran to the car and grabbed the EpiPen. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it was, um, it, it took too long okay? and he ended up, uh, you know, uh, going into a coma. Um, but he recovered, according to the article, um, and uh, he was uh, suing the hospital, uh, sorry, suing the, um, the restaurant uh, for causing him to have an anaphylactic shock. Uh, Moral of the story is if you uh, or you know someone who have this potential problem, it's a good idea to always carry your EpiPen. Oh, another uh, fun one uh, just to share with you is um, there is this tech, okay, uh, 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 tech, right? Um, a deer tech, actually, um, that if it bites you, then you cannot eat meat for the rest of your life. Okay, because it's really funny. I, I, I don't fully understand why, and people don't either. Um, but if, if you get bitten by this particular tick, it makes you have anaphylactic shock every time you have meat. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and then you basically have to switch to like a vegan diet or something. 
Um, so the, there was this man who, who loves to hunt in the US, okay? And um, uh, he has all these game meat stores in his freezer. Uh, but then one time while he was out hunting, um, he got bit by this thing. Uh, and, and he was so sad in the interview. He's like, oh, I, I have all these meats that I, I, I was saving uh, to, to enjoy later. Uh, but now he can't have any of it. Uh, if you want to read more about this story, you can you can search it up. This is called the Lone Star, Lone Star Tape. Okay, if you find out why it gives you meat allergies, send me an article. I would uh, love to read about it. But uh, as far as I, I I tried to research on it, I didn't find out why why there was like I mean like there might be like a evolutionary um, reason for it. Like uh, you know the the tick lives on a deer, right? So um, it doesn't want the deer to die potentially. Right. So if, if there is something that's hunting for the uh, for the for the deer in the wild okay, and uh, and 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 the tick kind of infected that particular animal, then that animal would no longer be able to eat the deer and potentially die off. Right. So it's like a protection of their host. Right. But in terms of like how the biology work, how how it actually makes you allergic to the um, to the meat, that is just uh, pretty fascinating stuff. Okay, so um, allergies is an overreaction against um, harmless things. But there are other problems with your immune system, okay? Uh, it is possible that your immune system uh, is targeting the wrong thing, so the wrong kind of re reaction. Instead of like the, the overreaction, now we have a wrong kind of, um, of reaction. Typically, the T cells in your thymus, if you remember, they have to pass a tolerance test before um, before uh, they can um, uh, come out of the thymus and mature, right? It has to pass the test where it will not recognize your own cells. But sometimes your body makes mistakes and inadvertently the, uh, the T cells that do recognize your own antigens end up coming out of the thymus. And that's the basis of autoimmune disorders. Some of the autoimmune disorders uh, do have a genetic uh, component to it, so it might be um, inherited. Um, and, and so one example is Graves' disease. We'll talk more about this later. But in Graves' disease, it targets your thyroid gland. Okay, your thyroid gland, it's here, right? You get thyroid is uh, higher up, thymus is lower down. And, and your thyroid uh, gland makes um, a, a, a metabolism hormone for you. Okay. And in Graves' disease, these antibodies will get stuck to your thyroid gland and basically uh, turns it on all the time. And you pump out excess amount of uh, hormones that would increase your metabolism uh, substantially. Okay. So you would uh, you know, have a, a rapid rate weight loss because you're metabolizing everything you eat. Uh, you would have irregular heartbeat. Uh, sweaty hands all the time and basically feel a little bit uh, jittery and, and irritable at all times. Um, and uh, that is, again, caused by the antibodies um, being stuck to your thyroid gland. Okay, and your thyroid might get a little bit big as well, right? We call that goiter. Uh, and also have the bulging eyes because the antibodies, um, for some reason, uh, in addition to the thyroid gland, it will also um, bind to the muscle around the eyes and causing it to have uh, inflammation and gives that bulging eyes um, uh, appearance, okay? Uh, that is that. Let's take a look at the next one here. So we talk about overreaction, having the wrong kind of reaction in autoimmune, and now there is um, an under reaction okay like not reacting enough all right so in this case uh we call it the immunodeficiency okay? so um there are two kinds of immunodeficiency we have primary immunodeficiency and secondary immunodeficiency okay primary is basically um you are born with it born with the condition Okay, it, it's um, it's ingrained in your genetics, and 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 you you inherit that the, the the condition basically. Secondary means you 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 caught it. Okay, it was uh, contracted after birth. 
So in primary immunodeficiency, uh, one example of that is what we call uh, SCID, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency, um, where the person is born with zero immunity. Right? Um, let me take a look at what's the next slide. Yeah, there is a, there is a, a famous case called the, the, the bubble boy. You might have heard of that before. Bubble boy. Um, he was born with a uh, skid. I mean, like many people before him probably born with skid as well, but they, they would die, right, from the slightest infection. Uh, but the bubble boy was famous because um, NASA, like the space people, NASA, uh, they created this uh, bubble uh, for the boy to live in. And the bubble was a sterile environment. The parents were not about, uh, allowed to hold him or interact with him anyway. Um, the food uh, and, the, and the water that the boy receives has to be completely sterilized. And he has to stay in the bubble uh, for, uh, for, for his life, basically. Right? Because as soon as he comes out, um, even airborne uh, pathogens could cause him to become very ill and potentially kill him. Uh, and so he lived in the bubble uh, for, um, for most of his life. Um, and later on, when he was like around 10 or 11, um, NASA kind of uh, created this suit for him to wear so he can like at least run outside and, and, and things like that. Um, but still, he has to be in this contained area. Um, and what happens um, to this story was that um, when he was 12, I believe, um, the technology that allows for bone marrow transplantation bone marrow transplantation was uh, was maturing. Uh, and yes, it's the same as the bubble baby syndrome, yes. Uh, and so what happens is um, they, they took the bone marrow from the sister um, and then transplanted into uh, into this boy. Um, and he was doing he was doing great initially uh, after the transplant, um, but soon after he, he got very, very, very ill as well. Um, yeah, we're going to go back to secondary in a second. I'm just um, elaborating on the um, primary for now. Uh, and he got very sick um, uh, shortly after, and, and then he died um, after that. And when they take a closer look at what, what killed him, um, it was because of, uh, of leukemia. So some of you might, might, might know this. Um, there is something called an EBV, EBAR virus, um, that can live dormant. In a, in a person's um, DNA, okay, uh, and EBV is known to cause um, leukemia, and so the sister had the EBV in her in her bone marrow, but because she had a fully functioning immune system, her immune system was able to suppress the virus, and 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 therefore she's not getting the leukemia, right? Uh, but the boy who didn't have any immune system, when he received the bone marrow transplantation, the virus was able to manifest and, and cause the illness uh, in him. Um, I think there was a movie that was made um, about the boy. It's probably on YouTube or somewhere. Uh, but that's the story for uh, severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID. Um, and, and nowadays, right, uh, the people are continue to born with SCID, right? It's called the bubble baby syndrome, bubble boy syndrome. Um, but now we can use um, gene therapy right, as, as an option to, uh, to treat it. Um, and and you know, there has been successful cases um, where using gene therapy, they were able to um, uh, treat the, uh, the condition. Yep, bubble boy, bubble baby, uh, name after the bubble that they live in. So secondary immune immune deficiency is um, is something that you uh, contract later on in life, right? And one example of that would be uh, would be AIDS, okay? Um, acquire immunodeficiency syndrome caused by the HIV virus, right? Okay. So that's uh, that's what this slide is. The 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 in, in AIDS, um, the HIV virus actually cripples the entire immune system. Um, and, and it does that because it infects macrophages, uh, it infects other APCs, such as um, the den dendritic cells that we talk about, uh, and uh, even the helper T cells, right? So by uh, infecting all these cells and killing these cells, you essentially destroy the entire acquired um, immunity branch, right? So people who have HIV, uh, who have AIDS, um, they, they are not really... They don't really die from the AIDS itself. They die from like uh, secondary infections, right? 
So um, like people who, um, who, 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 who have uh, AIDS, they, they, they are very susceptible to pneumonia a particular form of pneumonia and they have no way of fighting it, right? So even like regular illnesses that you normally can fight off, um, it, it's now going to be to be lethal. Now, uh, Sashana raised a good point. Uh, can a child be born with HIV? Okay, so there is a situation where the mother uh, has AIDS and, and, and when the baby is in the mother's womb, um, the baby cannot catch the virus because the, the, the placenta protector shields it from the mother, right? Okay, but it's possible, uh, and, and sometimes it, it, it happens quite frequently, um, that when the baby comes out, because it's exposed to the mother's blood, right, uh, during birth, uh, then the baby could, could catch the HIV uh, during delivery, okay? So this is still considered as um, like a, 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 um, secondary, Okay, because it's not like genetically ingrained within you, right? Like the skid. Right? So that's how we distinguish between primary uh, and secondary. Does that answer your question? Was was that why you were a little bit um, confused between the two? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Now, uh, another quick story. Um, did you know some people cannot uh, get uh, A's? Okay, um, there is a mutation on one of the um, one of the receptor on your on your cells on on your white cells okay it's called the cxcr4 gene uh, and if you have a particular mutation uh, on that gene uh, the hrv virus cannot infect your white cells at all so you are immune to AIDS. okay like it's it's impossible for those people to get it um, that mutation is super rare uh, it only happens in a very very small percentage of um, of people of a particular um, uh, 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 descent. I forgot which population is, but like super rare, right? Uh, and so what happens is there was this person, um, he, he was called a Berlin uh, patient, uh, Timothy Ray Brown, that's his, that, that was his name. And uh, he, um, he had AIDS uh, and he uh, also had leukemia. And to try to treat his leukemia, people, uh, the doctor gave him a bone marrow transplantation, all right? Um, but the person who was donating the bone marrow um, actually had the had the protective mutation. Okay, they didn't know it at the time. Okay, uh, it was just a donor that has matching uh, bone marrow with uh, with Timothy, and they went ahead and do the transplantation. Uh, and they were they were shocked to find out that after the transplantation, his um, HIV viral load keep on going down and down and down, and eventually he was declared like HIV free. So for the longest time, he was the only person who was known to be to be cured of AIDS um, because of of those kind of bone marrow transplantation. Now at the time, people were saying, um, you know, it's it's virtually impossible for something like that to happen again because in order for the uh, for the person to have the mutation, the CXCR4 mutation, that's first, it's very super uh, super rare. Um, and and for that to be a matching donor for someone who has AIDS, that's like extra extra rare right so um they're saying so for something like this to happen again it's virtually impossible um that was like you know 20 some odd years ago uh and since then there has been three additional cases of where this is happening uh and you know now with the um technology of genetic manipulation and uh, and gene therapy they are hoping to gain more insights into these these patients who actually has recovered and, and perhaps one day we could engineer a cure for um, for AIDS. Uh, so that is uh, that is the end of um, of the uh, of the lecture. Uh, let's do one last poll question before we uh, wrap it up. Okay, uh, so anaphylactic shock, that would be uh, 
uh, uh, allergic re reaction. A's is um, an immunodeficiency, secondary. Graves disease, that's the one where the antibody binds to your thyroid gland. That is the uh, autoimmune disorder. Uh, and skid is the primary immunodeficiency. Okay. So that's it. Uh, that is the hardest lecture by far for the uh, for the um, for the unit because it has a lot of information. Um, but uh, but that's okay. You you guys did very well on the first quiz. Um, I assume you will also do quite okay for the second one. Um, well, since most of you are here, let's quickly talk about what's going on next week. Um, next week, we well okay. So so next class. Uh, we will we'll finish lecture four, and then we will take up the lab. So let's spend a moment and talk about the lab first. If you go to your um, eCentennial page and go to content, I mean, I'll post an announcement afterwards as well. But if you go to content um, and click on lab, there are the three labs. Okay, so what you need to do between now and Wednesday is to um, download this. I mean, you don't have to print it out. Um, you can just download the PowerPoint slides and, and answer all these questions, right? So label A, B, C, D, and state their function. So work through all of them, uh, and uh, we, will, um, we will take it up on Wednesday um, after we finish lecture four. Uh, this is, you don't have to hand this in, okay? This is just for you to do it. Um, and then for next week, um, next week, Monday, we will we will have a review class for test one. Uh, and we will uh, you, you will also have to complete lab quiz number one. So uh, if you go to assessment and quizzes, um, there is your lab quiz number one. Okay. In case you forgot about these things, these are 2.5% each, and um, it's actually available, uh, you know, tomorrow. But but don't do it, right? Like wait until we take up the lab first, right? Okay. Um, you have two attempts, and then it's the best score that that is going to be um, recorded, right? So these are basically free marks. Usually, we most people get you know 95 to perfect. Um, so that is due next um, Monday. Okay, uh, and we'll also have the test review. Uh, I will post a link to it, but if you go to content, uh, there is a folder called test review. Um, and, um, you know, you are encouraged to work through it uh, on your own first, and uh, we'll, we'll take it up next, uh, next Monday. Okay, the test will be next Wednesday. We don't have class next Wednesday. You just have to uh, take the test. It's available from same thing, 6 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. Uh, and the format is very similar to, to quiz one. Okay, I'll post the information regarding test one um, later on in the week. Are we okay? Any uh, question about the quiz, uh, about the test and you know what to expect? No, everybody's happy? Okay, uh, why don't we take a five minute break be before we start lecture four, uh, we will resume at um, 9.33, okay, 9.33. Let's see you in a bit. Let's continue to lecture four, um, which is the respiratory system. It's relatively easy compared to you know what we just went through, um, and it's uh, it's quite short as well. The main function of the respiratory system is to get the oxygen from the air from the environment all the way to um, to our blood and ultimately to our tissue, right? And so um, from the environment to the lungs. We call that pulmonary ventilation. So there are two um, parts to this. Right? You can have inhalation. That's breathing in. And then you have exhalation. 
which is breathing out. So we do this all the time. We do this, uh, you know, 15, 16 times every minute. And every time we inhale, we bring in oxygen. And every time we exhale, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Now, not to say that when you breathe out, there is no oxygen in that, right? There's some oxygen that we exhale as well, but majority of it, it's going to be carbon dioxide when we are exhaling. And when we are uh, inhaling, a majority of it would be, um, uh, would be uh, oxygen. Once it gets to our lungs, um, through diffusion, the oxygen in the, in, the, um, in the lungs will diffuse into the blood and that's called external respiration. It's gas exchange between the lungs and the blood. And the exchange between the blood and the tissue is what we call the internal respiration. Okay, so the oxygen will go all the way from the environment to the tissue, and the carbon dioxide will go all the way from the tissue back to the environment. And of course, inside the tissue, we also have cellular, cellular respiration. Right? Okay, and that just kind of shows the many uh, barriers that the oxygen has to cross before ultimately ending up in our cells, uh, where we will be able to use it to combine it with glucose and make carbon dioxide, water, as well as ATP. That's the reason why we have to breathe, right? So here is the uh, cellular respiration equation for you again. Uh, we learned this in extensive detail last semester um, in Electrify. Now, so what we normally call respiration is actually ventilation. I mean, respiration is a, is a big term now, right? Like it, it's, a, it's an umbrella term if you would encompass many different subtypes. Um, I, I guess like this is this is what we call breathing in general. When we say we breathe, we're talking about pulmonary ventilation. But when we say respiration, um, like now we know there's external, internal, and cellular respiration. So it's uh, I, I don't really hear people you know use the word respiration casually. Um, but I, I think when people do use it though, they they might be thinking about breathing, right? Um, but we know that it's actually ventilation now. Yeah, exactly. Okay, in terms of the uh, structures that the air passes through from the outside all the way into the um, into the lungs, it, it's separated into upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract. Okay, and the um, and the boundary uh, is where the larynx transition into the trachea. Uh, we'll explain more about what the larynx is and so on and so forth right now. Uh, anything above and including the larynx is going to be upper respiratory tract. So when you get an up, upper respiratory tract infection, like a cold, for example, they tend to go away after a week or two. Right? When you get a lower respiratory tract infection, like pneumonia, tuberculosis, right, all those things tend to linger for quite some time. Um, and it takes, you know, sometimes months to, to, to recover from it. Okay. All right, let's take a look at this diagram and um, we will we'll label it. Oops, um, this card. We will go to our study guide. Um, and if you go all the way to the end, the diagrams are usually at the, at the end, right? So please um, take a moment and find this. Okay. It's the same diagram as the um, as the PowerPoint one. So if you don't have the um, if you don't have the uh, handout printed, you can just keep looking at the um, at the PowerPoint ones. Uh, but there are some stuff that we I, I do want to uh, draw out to to explain a little bit better. First of all, this is a this is a mid sagittal cut. Okay, you cut right down the center, and you're looking at it from the side, right? Um, and 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 this is this is the nose, and um, it opens up to your nasal cavity, right? So you see your nasal cavity is actually really really uh, deep. Like if you if you think about picking your nose, um, then then it's just this immediate area, um, but inside is really really deep. So when you do like a COVID swab, 
goes all the way in there, right? So that's how, how deep it is. Um, and uh, uh, the nasal cavity is separated from your mouth, from your oral cavity by the heart palate right here. Okay, so that's the heart palate. That's made up of two bones. And we'll learn about the names of the bones later. But if you push your tongue up right now in your mouth, you feel something hard, right? That, that is the heart palate. Okay? Now, if you curl your tongue backwards, right, the heart palate eventually becomes softer. Right? And this softer part right here, that is just like a glandular tissue. Right? That's a, a mucus. That would be the soft palate. Okay, soft palate. No bones in there. Okay, so nasal cavity is separated from the oral cavity by the hard palate and a little bit of soft palate. The soft palate ends in a structure called the uvula, which is the same right here, the uvula. We saw the uvula before, right? If you open your mouth and look at it in the mirror, say, ah, right? There is the, there is the thing that dangles at the back, right? That's the uvula, right? And it seals off the, the little opening here that connects the throat to the nasal cavity when you are swallowing so that the food's not going to come back up from your nose. Your, um, the bones that makes up your, 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 your uh, um, skull, uh, some of the bones have cavities in them, like empty spaces in them. We call those uh, sinuses. Right? So there are three um, pairs of sinuses here. Right? You don't have to know the names. Okay? I'm just showing you. There's like a frontal sinus here. There's another um, spinoid sinus there. And then there are um, two other ones that you cannot see from this particular cut. Um, and just be aware that they are there. Okay, I'll tell you what the function of those are later on. And again, you don't, you don't, you don't have to memorize the names. Okay, the names are named after the bones that they are found in. And uh, when we get to lecture ten, you will learn the names of all the bones, anyways. So you know, right now you just don't have to worry about it. Okay, so let's label some of these things. Uh, you can you can put it at the bottom, but it's it's easier for me to just write next to it. Okay. Um, we have the nasal cavity right here. What color should I use? Let's use this one. Nasal cavity. Okay. And so uh, we breathe through the nasal cavity. Air goes in, pass through the um, nasal cavity where it will warm the air, it will filter the air, as well as moisten the air. And then we're going to go right here to the trachea. So it went through a couple of places along the way. Let's label some of these things, OK? Over here, E is pointing at this opening, this opening right here. Oops. That opening is um, how you get to the back of the throat from, from the nasal cavity. We call that the nasal pharynx. Okay, Pharynx is just the back of the throat. We can just call it throat. Okay. So you can go into the throat through the nose, and the opening that leads into it is called the nasal pharynx. Now, the air that we breathe will leave the pharynx through G, which is another opening here. That is called the laryngopharynx. Okay, so I can label this for you. Air enters the pharynx through here to the nasal pharynx and the laryngopharynx will say air leaves the pharynx here.
through here, through this opening. Now there is an opening that leads into your airway and you can't really see the opening here. I mean, like, because you, you cut it away, right? But you know, like I guess my, my toilet paper roll here, right? That this opening here that allows the air to go through that opening is called the glottis, which is what B is, okay? B is the glottis. We'll, we'll go through what they do when we go back to the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so that's just the opening that allows the air to go into your airway. Now, on top of the glottis, there is a little flap here. Okay, that flap is called the epiglottis. And the epiglottis will actually cover up the glottis when we're swallowing. We don't want the food to go down the wrong tube, right? You might have heard people say that before. We want the food to go down the esophagus and not the um, not the airway. So it's important for the epiglottis to seal off the opening, to seal off the glottis when we're swallowing. Below the glottis is the larynx. That's where you will find your vocal cord. It allows you to make sound. Uh, is the glottis a type of opening also? Yeah, yeah, glottis is a, is a whole, it's not a physical structure. Yeah, that's right, it's an opening, yeah. And, and finally, over here, D, that is the trachea. Okay, that's the airway. So that's the path that air takes. It'll go through all these things as, as it goes down. This is just an overview, right? Like I'm, I'm gonna explain in more detail um, when we when we go to the PowerPoint slides, okay? So this is just to show you where things are. Uh, in case this is not clear, I'm gonna put the word air. Okay, so another way to go to, to go to the throat is to swallow things, right? So for food and liquid, it's gonna go right through the mouth. And then it's going to go right here. So this opening that leads to the pharynx from the mouth, that would be the oral pharynx. Okay, and if you want, you can put it like food and liquid enters the pharynx through here. And then um, it's going to go into the esophagus. Uh, Brill asked, where is the border of upper? Okay, so larynx, anything above the larynx and above, that's upper respiratory um, tract. And then trachea and below, that's lower respiratory tract. Okay. So basically everything up here, right there, that's the upper respiratory tract. It's probably um, more clear from uh, from PowerPoint slide than, than over here. Any question before we uh, continue from here? It's a little bit messy here. I understand that. So if you need clarification, please do let me know. I just want to double check. The upper respiratory tract is above the trachea, yeah? Yes, so so not including the trachea, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few other things here that's a little bit subtle. Uh, uh, you might have missed it. Um, for example, there is the, there's the tonsil right here, right, at the back. Uh, and then here are some more tonsils tonsils here, that's the palatine tonsil, and then that's the lingual tonsil, right? This one is um, the, we call it the adenoid tonsil before. Oh, I can't really see that color, can you? Adenoid. 
Okay, so tonsils is part of your lymphatic system, right? It screens all these things that are coming into our body. All right, that's that. Switch back to the PowerPoint. I mean, this is all labeled for you anyway, so like, feel free to come back and compare it. So back to the nasal cavity, right? Nasal cavity is important for, um, again, it warms, moistens, and filters the air that we breathe. Um, especially on a cold day like this, right? It, 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 it almost hurts to breathe through your mouth right? because um, it lacks that capacity to, to add moisture to it and warms it up. And the way that it does that is because uh, the nasal cavity is connected to all these sinuses. Um, and the sinuses are lined with mucous membrane. And anytime you have mucous membrane, there are a lot of capillaries in them. Um, and with capillaries, there are, are blood in them and the blood contains warmth, right? Um, so breathing through your nose is going to help warm them up and, uh, and moisten them. Uh, and of course, there are all these um, hair in our nose um, that will help filter any dust particles out um, as well. So these are the sinuses uh, that we have. Uh, and sometimes you have like a sinus infection, right? And your doctor press on these uh, location and, and it hurts a little bit, right? Um, because of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, inflammation in some cases of the mucus lining um, and, and they could get stuffed up uh, by, by over secretion of mucus when you have a upper respiratory tract uh, infection, like a cold. Okay, let's uh, quickly try this. Um, there were several questions earlier that people asked. Which one are the lower respiratory tract? And it says select all correct answers, right? Uh, most people got it right, right? The trachea, definitely. Um, and since we haven't really talked about this one yet, I understand why people didn't choose it. Uh, but bronchus is also another one that's part of the lower respiratory tract. Um, we, we will talk about that shortly and, and you will know what it is and what it does. Uh, okay, let's do another one here. And again, if you don't see the poll, um, you can just type the answer in the chat box. That's another way to uh, participate. And the correct answer is the heart palate. Okay, you push up in your uh, in your mouth with your tongue, you feel something hard. That is the heart palate. It's made up of two bones that separates the nasal cavity from the oral cavity. Okay, so um, the throat, the the pharynx. Okay? Pharynx is a common passageway for food, water, and air. Everything that we breathe in, everything that we swallow will go through the uh, pharynx before heading down further. And we label the uh, diagram uh, and show that um, for air, it will enter the pharynx through the nasopharynx, and then it will leave it through the laryngopharynx. Uh, and, and after that, it will go through the glottis um, and then into the larynx. And that's why it's called the laryngopharynx, right? It's like a hole that connects the larynx and the pharynx together. Um, and food and water 
they enter the pharynx through the oral pharynx. Okay, so nasal pharynx and oral pharynx are two different ways to go into the throat, the pharynx, and then leaving the pharynx would be the laryngopharynx. It's much harder to visualize it from uh, from these uh, texts, but if you have the diagram right beside you, you'll be able to match them up. Okay. Uh, we talk about the tonsils, right? Um, the adenoid tonsils are located at the back of the nasal cavity. And then we have the palatine tonsils as well as the lingual tonsil. I already show you where these are. Uh, these are located uh, with the yellow highlighter uh, on the diagram, right? So you can take a look at that again later on. Uh, but more importantly, these are things that we already discussed in, um, in lecture two, I believe. So no need to spend too much time on them. Okay, let's talk about the larynx now. Okay, so larynx is um, where your vocal cords are um, located. And the opening that leads to the larynx, it's called a glottis. Okay, you can't really see it here, but like this would be like the opening. Okay, it's a hole, right? And then that hole is going to be called the glottis. And you want to cover that hold up when you're swallowing. And that's what the epiglottis is there for. Okay. Now, there are a bunch of bones and cartilage that help stabilize the, uh, the larynx. Okay. It's a very vulnerable uh, location. Like you probably, I can see it in movies or uh, hear about it on um, read about it on the news or something like that. If someone get hit at the throat here, it's possible for the uh, uh, lyrics to swell up and obstruct the airway and you know not going to be able to breathe, right? So it's important to protect them with um, with you know some some bones uh, and some cartilage. And so if you could go back to your um, study guide, there's a simple diagram here that I would like to label with you. Okay, and this should be on the um, second page, I believe. Okay, so this this whole thing right here, this is the lyrics. Okay, so the lyrics are some people call it the voice box, right? That's the um, uh, like the common name, if you would, allows you to produce sound. So there's a flap here. You can't see the whole flap from this view. This is an interior view. We're looking at it from the front. Probably should mention that anterior view. And that flap is the epiglottis, which covers the glottis. During swallowing. Now, if you could please uh, put your hands on your throat like this, like don't squeeze or anything, just gently put it on the on the neck here, okay? Actually, try it, okay? <laughs> and then swallow. You feel something pushing up? You should. Okay? Put your hands on the neck and then swallow. You will feel something pushes up, right? So that's your entire larynx pushing up against the epiglottis when you swallow it. People have this misconception. Um, they think like the, the epiglottis is like a toilet seat. It opens and opens and closes like that up and down, up and down. But the epiglottis actually doesn't really move. Okay, It's your lyrics that get pushed up against it um, when you're swallowing. And then that creates like a tight seal, um, which then, um, uh, which then you know, prevents the food from going uh, into your throat. Uh, give me a second. I forgot to... Um, uh, search something up to show you. Um, one second. Okay, so here is a video, right, of um, of uh, of what what it looks like when we're swallowing. So you see that? 
when you swallow this this is the epiglottis and 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 then the 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 lyrics actually pushes up against it um when we're swallowing right so you can see the flap right here right see it doesn't actually go up and down it just stays where it is and then it's the lyrics that pushes up uh and uh, and creates the tight seal so that the food is going to go down at the back okay i think there's a better video maybe i'll find it later on but that's what it does okay now there are other bones here that would help stabilize your lyrics uh and here is one of them right there that is called the hyoid bone We have some ligaments here, and then when when you touch your throat here, uh, the the hard part that you feel, that's basically this big bone. That is called a thyroid cartilage. So cartilage are more flexible than bone, right? Like your ear and nose is made up of cartilage. They have some flexibility to it. Uh, and that protects the majority of the, um, of the larynx. Uh, and for men, this is more prominent. And that's why like men have the um, so-called like Adam's apple, right? Okay. And below here is another bone, uh, cartilage, sorry, another cartilage. That is called the cricoid. C R I C O I D, cricoid cartilage. And all these cartilage is just meant for stabilization of the, of the larynx. Uh, and, and this over here, that is your um, trachea. And as we will see uh, in a bit, the trachea is protected by these cartilage rings. cartilage rings. Okay, so there you go. Uh, those are the um, main structures that is in the throat area. Okay. Just going to wait a little bit for people to catch up and then we'll go back. So this conveys the same information. Uh, this is the epiglottis. This was the x-ray thing I was trying to show you. And uh, again, during swallowing, the larynx moves upward against the epiglottis, which itself is made up of a elastic cartilage. And that seals off the trachea, allowing the food to go down the esophagus. Um, if you try to talk and swallow at the same time, right, it's possible that the uh, epiglottis is not uh, creating a nice seal, and the food is going to go down your um, trachea, okay? and that could cause choking. Uh, this was the video I was trying to show you, but it didn't really work. Um, I don't know why. Like usually, I embed it into the PowerPoint; it, it plays, but for some reason, it doesn't. That's why I had to search it up. Anyway, so your vocal cords are in your lyrics, uh, allows you to produce sound. Uh, they actually vibrate as air is passing through them. Now, here is a thing that people don't really uh, put much thought into it. And then, you know, when I ask them to try it out, they, they, they realize, oh, this is actually something that's quite interesting. Um, I want you to uh, pinch your nose, okay? Pinch your nose and close your mouth and then try to hum your favorite tune, okay? Hum a song or something. Go ahead and give you a couple seconds to try that. Close your mouth, pinch your nose, and then you try to hum, hum a song. And for many people, that's the first time they realize it's impossible, right, to do it. Right? You actually cannot make any sound if you pinch your nose and close your mouth and you sealed off all the, um, all the openings that allows air to come out. Well, that's because the vocal cords 
it's like um it's like a wind instrument it's like a you know think of like a, a trumpet or like a flute if there is no air movement through the uh vocal cords you cannot produce vibrations and you cannot produce sound right that's why if you close up all the openings no air movement no sound is produced and that's why when someone is choking right they they actually cannot they cannot tell you if they're choking or not, right? If you see your your friend at the at the dinner, they started coughing violently, right? And and then and then you're like, are you choking? And then if they tell you, yes, I'm choking, then they're not really choking. Because if you're actually choking, right, the food is completely blocking your airway. Nothing comes out, nothing goes in. That's why you can't breathe and and and, and you can't talk. And that's when you're like actually choking, right? Uh, and so the vocal cord, it's a skeletal muscle, which means you actually have full control over it. Um, and and you, you just have to think about what kind of tone you want to make. And the vocal cords automatically adjust the, the, um, the tension and the thickness to create those pitch for you. It's quite amazing. Like if you want to have a higher pitch, then it's going to be a, a higher tension, right? And if you want to have a lower pitch, then it it, it, it loosened the tension a little bit. It's like, a, again, like a string uh, instrument, like a violin, like a guitar. If you tighten the string, it gives a higher higher note, right? And if you loosen the string, it gives like a lower note. Uh, and that's exactly how your vocal cords uh, uh, work, okay? Now, uh, this is a very interesting uh, video. Uh, let me see if I can share the sound with you. Um, how do I share a sound? share sound there we go um let's see if you can hear what i hear this is um someone doing um uh, a laryngo laryngoscopy right that's basically like a, uh looking at your your larynx okay um with um with a with a with an endoscope with a camera i actually had this done uh, on me when I was about six years old okay and I'll tell you about it afterwards but they basically stick it up your nose and then um you know, go go through the nasopharynx and then uh, eventually um, go all the way to take a look at your vocal cords. So these white things, they are the vocal cords of this person. And I want you to pay attention to the sound that she's making um, uh, and, and, and take a look at how the vocal cord changes. So here we go. Let me know if the sound is not working, okay? So you see the, the the thickness of the of the of the vocal cord actually changes um, as she was doing the the different pitch. Now, what is this thing right here? Uh, this U shape uh, thing that my mouse is uh, is hovering over. Can anybody tell me? It's one of the things we've labeled. Okay. That's right. That is the epiglottis. Excellent. Okay. So like when 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 she swallow if she swallows, then the 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 whole uh, larynx is going to push up against this epiglottis, uh, and it will completely seal off this airway. Now you see all these ridges here, right? All these little little bands, right? Those are actually the the grooves created by the by the cartilage that's surrounding your trachea, okay? Uh, and 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 they they create such a, a snug uh, protection against your trachea that you can even see it. Uh, from the inside, okay? So um, every time she makes the sound, see now it's really low voice and it's really thick, right? The um, the uh, the vocal cords. Uh, anyway, if you want to watch more of that, you can uh, totally um, look it up yourself. Are those the cartilage rings? Like you mean, you mean the groove that I was showing you earlier? Like, uh, I can't really pinpoint, like, like these grooves? Yeah, yeah, those, those are not the the cartilage is the cartilage rings are on the outside, but because they grab on the larynx so tight that you can see the grooves uh, from the inside. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, okay, great. All right, so like quick story. Uh, when I was uh, when I was a kid, um, this is uh, based on my mom's uh, you know recollection of what's, what's going on. Like I, I apparently have these tantrums, okay, and I and I scream out a lot uh, when I don't get what I want. Um, and I scream so much that my voice started to become very raspy, okay? Um, and so, you know, they were concerned. So they took me to this throat doctor. And uh, I, I remember I was just around six years old. Um, and, and the reason I remember was because they stuck that tube up my nose um, to check my uh, vo vocal cords to see why, you know, my voice was really, really raspy. Um, and, and, you know, way to go to, to traumatize a six-year-old kid. <laughs> I know I was traumatized because I still remember it. Um, they, they had this big um, 
TV screen that shows a live feed of 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 the of the camera as the thing was going up my nose, and the doctor didn't bother to tell me to not look at the screen. So I was looking at at my own throw with this big camera uh, uh, shoving down my my nose, uh, and 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 I remember the doctor telling my uh, my mom, oh look, this is uh, this is his vocal cord, and you can see there's a little little scarring going on here, uh, and that's why his voice was you know uh, uh, very raspy. And then so my mom asked the doctor, you know. Uh, you know what can we do about it? And and the doctor had the perfect um, perfect uh, therapy. So, well, he just had to like not talk for the next uh, couple of weeks, and uh, eventually, you know, give it time, and he's going to be okay, right? So <laughs> I was like so scared, right? Um, because my mom was like, yeah, you know, if you keep on screaming, we're going to have to go back to the doctor, and he's going to have to shove it up your nose again, and, and and you don't want that, right? So you know, you better not scream again. Um, anyway, long story short. Um, my voice turns out to be fine, and as you can tell, uh, I, I can teach with it with uh, with, <laughs> with no raspy voice. Uh, but that's the uh, that's the um, laryngoscope. Okay? It goes up the nose uh, through the nasal cavity, through the uh, oral pharynx, right? Nasal pharynx rather, and then it would go through the glottis. Uh, and and as you saw in the video, you can see um, the vocal cords. Now, if uh, food does get uh, stuck in your trachea, then you have to do the Heimlich maneuver, right? Uh, if someone else is available um, to help, they basically would squeeze on your abdomen and, and create like a, like a rolling motion in and up, right? Uh, that would help increase the pressure in your abdominal cavity and that will help push the, um, the, the whatever stuck in your throat, uh, whatever stuck in your airway to push, put, to push that out. Um, if you plan to go into um, nursing, I think it's a requirement that you guys learn how to do the CPR. Uh, and if you're choking on your own and no one's around, uh, you know, try to uh, you, you try to dislodge it yourself, then you would have to use like the uh, the back of a chair uh, as a, as a pressure point to help um, you know push the uh, push the food out yourself. And hopefully, you'll be able to do it. Um, I always have this fear that I'm choking all by myself at home. Um, I, I have a plan that I, I, I would speed dial 911 first before throwing myself onto a chair, um, just in case that doesn't work out. Uh, I used to uh, work at Sick Kids before I became a teacher. I did research there for a couple of years. And uh, in the hallway, they have this, um, this, uh, this framed um, frame. Okay, they have this frame uh, and they have a couple of them. Uh, and it and it's all the stuff that they took out of kids' uh, air passageway and food passageway, and it's so bizarre uh, the kind of stuff that you know uh, kids put in their mouth uh, and in their nose. Like I mean, look at the bobby pins, right? They they actually swallow that. I I hope um, you know it it wasn't opened when they swallow it. That would be pretty damaging. Um, like and and I used to just you know stare at this in amazement and think like, what do the numbers represent? Oh, I think it's just like the um, the sample number. Like, uh, I don't think they actually mean much. Or, or maybe they mean object two hundred sixty. Oh yeah, they're probably like the this is the two hundred sixty eighth object that they have removed from the food passageway or something like that. Remember, this is not the only one, right? They have like couple ones uh, on the wall. So like, I I I didn't have kids back then, and I look at this, and I'm just like, oh, how can, like, how can parents be so you know careless and you know leave things lying around? And then I had my own kids, and and then I realized how wrong I was. Like, you just can't control these kids. Like, they just put everything in their mouth. Like, um, my 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 younger kid when she was um just a little bit under a year and a half right um i was just cooking in the kitchen and then um and then my wife came down uh you know and, and saw the, the 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 kid holding a blue stress ball and then she was like were you looking at her i was like no i'm cooking and then she's like she's eating this stress ball so we look at the stress ball and you know, it was like a, like a regular size stress ball and, and she ate a good like one eighth of it. OK, and then we're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? Should we take her to the um, to the emergency? And then we're like, oh, but she seems fine. And she swallowed all that thing. But and then the next day we, we were checking the diaper to see if there are like blue stuff coming out, like just to make sure that it passes through our system and, and didn't stay in the body. Um, anyway, she grew up fine. Um, but. You know, kids, they, they literally put everything into their mouths. Um, that, was a, that was a lesson that I learned. 
Okay. Uh, the vocal cords are found in, uh, hopefully you know the answer to this one. I'm not going to do the poll. Um, the vocal cords are found in the larynx. Okay, if you confuse between the pharynx and the larynx, which um, is something that's common, just remember when you're singing, when you're singing, la, 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 right? That's the larynx, okay? And that's where the vocal cords are, allows you to produce sound. Okay? The pharynx is the back of the throat. This is the voice box. All right, let's take a look at this one. You would know the answer if you were paying attention. And uh, that would be correct. That is the thyroid cartilage. Okay, thyroid cartilage. Very good. So that's it. That's it for the upper respiratory tract. It's time to move on to the lower respiratory tract. So here is the uh, lyrics again, right? Uh, with all the protective cartilage, uh, the thyroid cartilage, the um, cricoid cartilage. And then we have the trachea right here. So you can see the trachea is protected by all these uh, cartilage rings. Uh, the function of the rings is to uh, ensure that your trachea is open at all times. Because when we exhale, when we breathe out, it actually creates a negative pressure in our airway. And, and whenever you have negative pressure, it causes things to collapse and close it, right? So we, we don't want the airway to close um, because we, we want to keep it open at all times. Um, and, and that's what the cartilage rings are for. Um, because once the airway closes, it's, it's moist on the inside, right? And, and just like a plastic bag that has moisture inside, um, they stick to each other, right? So we really don't want the airway to collapse uh, because all those moisture would make it difficult to reopen again. Um, and so that's why we need to have the cartilage to, to, to prop it open and to maintain um, an accessible airway. Now, behind the trachea, as we saw earlier in the diagram, uh, we have the esophagus. Okay, so esophagus goes down to the stomach, right? Um, and if you take a transverse section um, of the uh, trachea and the esophagus, it looks something like this. Okay, so the trachea, the opening is much uh, bigger than the esophagus. Um, and the cartilage ring is C-shaped, right? We, we, we don't have a full ring going around it because that would be grabbing the esophagus as well, right? So just a C-shaped cartilage ring like that. Uh, the esophagus, uh, sorry, the trachea is not too long, um, like about uh, 12 centimeter-ish. I, I mean, obviously if you're a taller person, you have a longer trachea, right? Um, but then, but then it would start splitting uh, into um, the bronchus um, after around 12 centimeter ish. Now, if we take a look at the inside of the um, trachea, it's made up of two types of cells. Okay? So we have the goblet cells, which are what these um, beige looking spheres are, uh, and and the function of the goblet cells is to produce produce mucus. Now, mucus is, is very important because they trap uh, pathogens, right? Um, and and uh, once they're trapped, the cilia is going to help remove them. Right? So the cilia will sweep all these trapped mucus and particle up to your throat. And then, you, you know, you can blow it out, you can spit it out, you can uh, get rid of, swallow it sometimes, right, for some people. Uh, uh, and that will dispose of the pathogen. Now, the kind of uh, tissue uh, that makes up the inner lining of your trachea is something called pseudo 
stratified ciliated columna. Now that's a really long name. Okay, I'm going to explain what that means. Okay, so pseudo stratify ciliated columna. Stratify means multiple layers, multiple layers, and pseudo means uh, thick. Uh, ciliated means it has cilia, and columna means like rectangular shape, right? Rectangular shape, and then they have cilia on them. All right, so take it together. What does it mean? All right, that means it appears to be to have multiple layers, but that's that's fake. That's an illusion. It's not really multiple layers. It just looks like it has multiple layers, but in fact, it's just a single layer. So if we take a look at this uh, picture again, right? This is a real picture and this is like a cartoon version of it. All, right, all these purple circles, they are um, nucleus, nuclei. And it looks like you have multiple layers of it, right? So that's why it's stratified. But if you if you take a closer look at the, the cell, right? It's actually a single cell that makes it all the way to the basement membrane. Okay, the basement membrane is the underlying um, connective tissue that attaches all the cell. Uh, and so even though it looks like it's multiple layer, it's just a single layer. And every now and then you would have a goblet cell here and a goblet cell and a goblet cell. Right? So two types of tissues that makes up our uh, uh, airway, our trachea, the uh, pseudostratify, ciliated columna, as well as the goblet, uh, goblet cell. Uh, everything else we, we talked about already, right? The uh, trachea connects the lyrics to the bronchi. Uh, and it's in front of, right, anterior and parallel to the esophagus. The trachea is supported by C-shaped cartilage rings, uh, which prevents it from collapsing. And finally, the cilia helps sweep up the mucus uh, towards the pharynx. It is possible in some cases that uh, there are some kind of trauma to the to the face, um, and and that causes the blood to to block off the airway um, uh, from the from the uh, from the uh, glottis as well as from the uh, from the uh, from the pharynx. Okay, like if you if your uh, nose is like damaged, um, uh, the the blood can be pooling so much that it blocks off um, all the uh, airways from from the mouth and from the nose, and the person is not able to breathe. And again, this is something that you might have seen on the movies where they have to do um, emergency tracheostomy. Okay, and and so they create a little insertion here, right? And they insert a tube um, that directly connects to your trachea, and the person would be breathing through uh, that opening here because everything else is blocked um, above, right? Okay, moving on. Uh, the bronchus. So if you think about your main airway, this would be the uh, trachea. It was split into the bronchus. Okay, so um, we have the right one and the left one, which each will lead into the left lung and the right lung. And then inside the lung, they would continue to branch. Okay, so you can see here is the primary bronchus coming off from the trachea and it goes into the lung, the left lung in this case. And then it will it will split into secondary bronchus and then it will continue to split into tertiary bronchus. That's right, inflammation of the bronchus is called bronchitis. That's correct. And so it will continue to branch and become this like upside down tree almost um, inside your lungs. So let's uh, let's label this thing together uh, in the um, in the study guide, and we'll come back to it in a bit. Uh, you know, let's do this diagram first, and um, we'll work our way backwards. Okay, so to give you a moment to find this picture. All right, so over here, we have uh, this thing. This is, of course, the thyroid cartilage. Okay. Okay. 
And over here, we have the Krikoi cartilage. And you should know by now that this whole thing is our larynx, right? Now, if you want, you can add the epiglottis here. And then that opening right here that goes into the larynx, that's the glottis, right? So that's everything we've learned so far. Okay, how about this? Right, this tube right here. You should recognize that as the trachea. And it's protected by all these cartilage rings. C-shaped though, because we don't want to constrict the esophagus that's behind. Now, the trachea will split into the primary, primary bronchus. Bronchus is singular, bronchi is plural. Okay, so over here, we have the right primary, sometimes called main, bronchus. And on the other side, we have the left primary or main bronchus. Now, uh, it will continue to branch inside the lungs. Uh, let me see if I can do this for you without making it too confusing. Okay, so like immediately coming off, these would be like the secondary branches, right? Secondary. Secondary bronchus. and then continue to branch off to smaller ones, right? On the other side as well. Uh, these would be the tertiary bronchus. It's probably easier to visualize it if you draw your own. So that's the trachea. primary, secondary, and then tertiary, right? Like it, it, they just keep on getting smaller and smaller, right? So primary, secondary, tertiary, right? Now, just gonna keep going here. It will eventually become very, very small. Okay, so these really small ones, they are called bronchioles. Bronchial. And at the end of the bronchial, there is going to be little air sacs. This is called alveolus. Alveolus. That's where you will do gas exchange. All right, so the airway just keeps on splitting and splitting. And you can see again, it's like an upside down tree. And at the, when it gets really, really small, we call it the bronchial. At the very end of the bronchial, you would have your alveolus. Right? This is just the right lung and the left lung.
Any question? I hope that makes sense. So that's what this picture shows. And you can see that uh, the primary bronchus and the secondary bronchus, um, they are also protected by cartilage rings. Now, mind you, these ones, um, they are actually uh, having a full circular ring instead of the C shape, because there's nothing behind the bronchi, right, to kind of, um, you know, get in the way. So you, you would have an actual full, uh, full ring. But when you get to the smaller tertiary um, bronchi, uh, it would be too restrictive to have an entire ring around it. So instead, we have these are cartilage plates that are, are just like sticking onto it, kind of like, you know, little pieces of, of jigsaw puzzle that, that uh, glues onto the surface and that provides a little bit of support. Okay? And again, the reason of having that instead of the full ring is that the, the, the airway by this point is quite small. And if you put a ring on it, it's going to be too cumbersome, uh, too, um, too bulky, right? Um, and, and it's just not going to be working out too well. So instead, you just have these very tiny cartilage plates. So we'll continue to branch until you have these bronchioles, uh, which are really, really small, and they actually don't have any cartilage on them, OK? Uh, and at the end, you would have the alveoli. Bronchioles are the smallest conducting airway, uh, typically smaller than one millimeter in diameter. Right? So a millimeter is the distance between two two uh, lines on your on your ruler. Right. So if the if the diameter is less than that, we by definition call it a bronchiole. Uh, they do not have the cartilage support, like I said. But the inside, they still have the cilia. They still have uh, some of the, uh, the mucus-producing goblet cells. Because they do not have the cartilage, that means they are collapsible. Right? And that's what happens during an asthma attack. Um, the smooth muscle will cause the bronchioles to contract. And by contracting, you're reducing the diameter, making it difficult to breathe. And that creates that wheezing sound, which is characteristic of someone who is having an asthmatic attack. At the end of the bronchio, we will have the air pockets called the alveoli. Alveoli is plural, alveolus is singular. So here is the uh, a closer look at the alveoli. You basically have the bronchio here and it connects to a cluster of these alveoli. All the alveoli are actually surrounded by these um, capillaries, okay? And, and connecting this with the cardiovascular system, you remember the pulmonary artery, right? Um, which uh, connects the right ventricle, right? All the way, take the blood to all the way to the lungs. But when it gets to the lungs, eventually it will branches off into these smaller capillary networks that kind of uh, surrounds the entire alveoli. The best way to think about this is if you buy fruits at the supermarket, sometimes they come with a little styrofoam netting to protect the, the fruits right, from getting bruised and whatnot, right? Um, the alveoli uh, are, are basically like the fruits, and then the capillaries are like the little styrofoam that wraps around them, um, and, and it allows gas exchange to occur. Right? If you remember from the, um, from the very first slide that we talked about, right, this is external respiration. Uh, when the air from the lungs goes into the blood, right? Okay, so I'm going to draw uh, uh, Ryan Nock to kind of explain this uh, situation to you um, because it is, uh, can be a little bit confusing. Uh, so class notes. All right. Um, so for efficient, efficient gas exchange to occur, 
we need number one large surface area and number two we need a moist surface the more surface area you have the more available uh, space that the oxygen can cross and you can exchange faster that way and the oxygen needs to dissolve in uh, water first before it can goes into your blood that's why we need to have a moist surface so how do you pack a lot of area in a small space such as the lung well it turns out sphere like a, like a ball is the best shape that has the highest surface area to volume ratio that means is the shape that takes up the least space while providing the most surface area that's why if you look at a alveoli um, uh, cluster they are spherical in shape like this okay so this is the alveolus now to create a moist surface we would have some uh, moisture on the inside and the moisture is nothing other than uh, water okay this is a uh, exaggeration okay like you're not going to be drowning in water like that it's just a very thin coating and so this actually creates a little bit of a problem right we're going to put some h2o here you learned this from maybe from me last semester or you learned it from your chemistry class what is one word that we use to describe water in terms of um, you know uh, its property that allows them to attract each other what's that word that i'm looking for that's right they are polar molecule and therefore they are attracted to each other right this water molecule is going to attract that one and so on and so forth so it creates like a like an attraction force that would collapse your alveolus right it's kind of like putting magnets inside uh, a plastic bag and then all the magnets just you know attract each other and closes your alveolus so that creates a problem okay these are called surface tension so h2o are polar molecules and their attraction towards each other create surface tension So that's the first point. Surface tension interferes with inhalation, but benefits exhalation. think about why that's the case it's always trying to close the alveolus so if you want to breathe in you have to you have to you have to have enough force to counteract that contraction right you have to like open up the alveolus again think of like blowing air into a balloon right the balloon is elastic and it's always trying to squeeze the air out so you have to apply enough force to kind of kind of force it open to accept the air right that's why the surface tension interferes with inhalation but it benefits exhalation. Again, think about the balloon. As soon as you let, let go of the neck, right, the air will just come out automatically on its own. And that's what the surface tension is doing. It squeezes on the alveolus and it will help squeeze the air out. So far, so good. Any question before I move on to a second force? You have to understand this first though, before I explain the second one. Now, if that's the only force in our lungs, uh, then it would be very tiring to breathe in all the time. Okay, like you actually have to have to have to use active um, energy to to just breathe in, and and so we don't we don't really want that, right? Um, and there are these other cells in the um, in the alveolus 
Uh, they are called septo cells. And these septo cells secrete an oily substance called surfactant. So the surfactant will actually counteract some of these um, uh, surface tension because like oil and water don't mix together, right? And it creates like an opposing force that will allow the alveolus to open. Okay, so the surfactant breaks surface tension and aids in inhalation. Okay, so by allowing the alveoli to expand, you will help with breathing in. But breaking the surface tension will reduce the elasticity of your uh, of your lungs, right, of the alveoli. So now breathing out um, is is not as easy. I mean, it's still relatively easy, uh, but because you break up some of the surface tension, it will it will slightly interfere. with exhalation. So these are like very delicately balanced uh, opposing forces in your lungs uh, that allows, you know, inhaling and exhaling to, to occur without too much effort, okay? Uh, having too much of one over the other is, uh, is, is not, not a good thing. It's all about balance, okay? Having the right ratio. All right. Babies who are born prematurely, um, they sometimes are born so early that their lungs didn't have the chance to make the surfactant yet. Okay? So without the surfactant film, the alveoli are collapsed due to the surface tension, right? And they won't be able to breathe on their own. Um, that's why these uh, babies who are born prematurely um, they have to receive um, like a little bit of a, of a steroid injection, right, through the nose. Um, and, and, and that serves as like um, artificial surfactant to help open up um, their airway so that they can breathe on their own, right? So these, this the condition where they don't have the surfactant yet. It's called infant respiratory distress syndrome. Sometimes if they anticipate the baby is going to come out early, um, they might even give the steroid to the mother uh, which then can go into the baby, actually. Um, and um, it will help open up their airway um, as well. Uh, which of the following is not protected by cartilage? Basically, all of them are protected except for the bronchioles, right? The bronchioles are the really small one. It's the, kind of like the last part of the airway before they transition to become the alveoli. Okay, uh, this is to talk about the lungs and the pleura. Okay, we'll just uh, end with labeling uh, a diagram here, another diagram, uh, and then we'll finish the rest next class. So here we go. This is just the diagram before the last one we label. Uh, by now, you should recognize most of these things. Okay, so over here, that is, of course, the nasal cavity, warms, moisten, and filters air. This whole thing you should know by now is the pharynx. And that here, that's the larynx. Pharynx is uh, 
common passageway for food, liquid, and air. The larynx contains vocal cords. Uh, this over here, uh, of course, you know what that is. That's trachea. And over here, we have the right lung. Right lung. The right lung actually has three lobes. We have the superior lobe. We have the middle lobe. Then we have a tiny one that's tucked away here. That's the inferior lobe. Lobe, lobe, lobe. On the right side, on the left side rather, on the left side, left lung, there are only two lobes. We have the superior lobe, and then we just have the inferior lobe. Okay. I mean, the heart sits right in between, right? This is probably probably because the heart is taking up a little bit of space, so there's only two lobes instead of three. What's this thing right here? Can anyone tell me? It's kind of weirdly drawn. But what is that? The diaphragm? That is correct. That is a diaphragm. Thank you. One of the most misspelled word in the course. That's diaphragm. Many people spell diagram. That's the breathing muscle, right? We'll see how the diaphragm helps breathing in the now next class. Okay. So I'm going to spend the next uh, five minutes or so explaining this last thing right here. Uh, let's choose a nice color that we can use. It's hard for me to um, to do it on the computer. I try my best here. So we're going to go around the lungs. Okay, like that. So there's a membrane that goes around the lungs. Just like there's a membrane that goes around the heart, right? Okay, so it's a double layer membrane. It's called the pleura. And then I'm gonna try to draw this out for you. And you should draw it out as well. This is lung, one of them anyways. And the pleura is a double layer membrane, right? So there is gonna be an inner membrane and then there's gonna be an outer membrane. So let me draw the inner membrane right here, the one that is touching the lungs. And it will be um, going around the entire lung. Oh boy. There we go. Now, if you remember anything from the heart, from the cardiovascular system, you might remember that the one that's touching the organ, that's the visceral. Visceral pleura. Singular now, okay. Now, on the outside, again, this is not to scale. I am 
exaggerating the picture so that you can have a better look. There is another layer that's going to be the parietal. Parietal pleura. Right? Now the parietal pleura is either going to be touching the inside of your chest wall or it's going to be touching the diaphragm. Okay. Do you know what I mean when I say the inside of the chest wall? You're like, like you know, if you if you think of the the person, right? Person. Okay. That's gonna be the parietal pleura touching the inside of the chest wall, and at the bottom, at the bottom, it will be touching the diaphragm, like that. Okay. I'll explain more in a second. Now, between the visceral and the parietal pleura, you're going to have some fluid. We had this situation going on with the heart as well, right? Remember? There was some fluid there, right? This is called a pleural fluid. And in case it is uh, not obvious to you, these things forms the pleura. Okay, just add an e to make it plural. Between the pleura is the pleuro fluid. Now the function of the pleuro fluid, which we will explain a little bit more next time, but this allows the movement. of the lungs to be tethered to the movement to the movement of the chest and the diaphragm. Basically, when things are wet, they tend to stick together, right? So the, the pleural fluid allows the, 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 the visceral layer to be stuck to the parietal layer. Okay, I'm going to try to explain this the best I can. Uh, it's really hard to do it like virtually when you can't really see me. Uh, but look at this diagram, right? Okay, like when we take it, when, when we breathe in, like, like that, right? Like you feel the chest going up, right? Like this, going up and now. Okay. So we'll talk more about this next class. But right now, if you think about the chest moving out, because the, the orange layer is stuck to your chest. So when your chest moves out, the orange layer will move out with it, right? Okay. But because of the pleural fluid, when the orange layer moves out, it will pull the visceral layer along with it. And since the visceral layer is stuck to your lungs, that means your lungs will get pulled along with the chest, which means if your chest expands, it will cause your lungs to expand as well. That's what I mean by the movement of the lungs is connected, it's tethered to the movement of your chest. Basically, when your chest moves, your lungs moves with it. And that's because of the pleura. Same thing, when your diaphragm moves, when your diaphragm moves down, for example, it will pull the lungs down with it. So collectively, the, the chest um, and the diaphragm will allow the lung to expand, and that expansion is what allows breathing to occur. Do you understand that? If a person has like a puncture wound, right, we, it's called pneumothorax, we will revisit that next class as well. The puncture can cause the, the liquid to, to leak out. And once you lose the liquid, the orange layer, the parietal pleura, will no longer be uh, stuck to the visceral layer. So your chest could be moving, but your lungs are not moving with it. 
So like you are doing the act of breathing, but you're not actually inhaling because the lungs is not expanding with your chest. So you, you wouldn't be able to breathe on the side of the lung that has the puncture. Okay. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. Um, just before I go, just want to remind you to uh, do the lab um, and, uh, and, and we'll take it up on Wednesday, but it's, it's important that you try it out on your own uh, uh, first. OK, I'll post an announcement to where to find the lab and, and stuff like that, as well as information for the test um, later on today, maybe. All right. I'll see you on Wednesday at 830. Have a good day, guys. Thanks for coming. Bye.